My name is Dr. Sabra Abbott. I'm a neurologist at Northwestern in Chicago, and I specialize in sleep disorders. So what we're going to talk about today is, first of all, just a discussion of what sleep even is. Then we're going to go through common sleep disorders that can impact anybody. And then at the end, I'm going to focus specifically on how scleroderma might impact your sleep. I tried to keep the number of slides limited so that we can have time for questions at the end as well. And so I will try to keep us on time and allow time for anything that you might want to know also. So I always like to, to begin discussions about sleep with this picture here. And it's entitled The Nightmare. And it's a little dark, so I'm not sure if you can make out all of it. But you can see that there's this woman who is completely relaxed. She has absolutely no muscle tone at all, seems completely unaware of what's going on in the world around her. She's got this sort of demon-like figure sitting on her chest that you can see right here. It seems like it's sort of holding her down, keeping her from being able to move. And if you can make out sort of over in the background, that's, there's this very creepy, ominous looking horse figure sitting over there. So this is just one depiction by an artist of what it's like to sleep. We often think of sleep as this much more pleasant experience, but this is just one other side of it. And as we're gonna discuss later when we get into some of the sleep disorders, this, I think, actually is also a depiction of something experienced by patients who have narcolepsy. And so you can have sleep paralysis, where you feel like you're being held down and you can't move. And you can also see these dreamlike images while you're in that transition between wake and sleep. So one of the biggest questions that we always get asked in the realm of sleep is, why is it that we even sleep? So Alan Rechtschaffen, who's one of the pioneers in the research in this field, once said, if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it is the biggest mistake evolution ever made. If you think about it, every single day we're putting ourselves in this very vulnerable position in a state where we're unaware of our environment. And so why is it that we do this every single day? This is just an example of it. If you look at various unique places to sleep, this is one that you can find. So we're sitting there out in the environment, vulnerable to predators. What is the reason behind this? Predators may actually be one of those reasons. So we're what we call diurnal species. We tend to do best during the day. We can't see as well or function as well at night. So it may be that having this state of inactivity where we have to kind of hide ourselves away in caves, limit our interaction with the, the environment, actually puts us in an advantage so that we don't get eaten by nocturnal predators, those that see better and function better at night. So one potential function. It also allows us to recover from our daily activities. So when we're up and we're active and we're moving all day, we need a chance to rest and recuperate from that. It also allows us to conserve energy. And so there's a time when we need to forage, we need to find food, we need to be active, but we also have to conserve some of that energy so we aren't constantly just searching for food and eating it. You can see as an example, over here, we have very large animals here who really only sleep two to three hours, whereas if you look at this little bat over here that has very little energy reserve, it's sleeping up to 19 hours a day. So even though across all of biology, almost every organism has some form of sleep, the amount of sleep varies substantially. We also know that sleep helps us to consolidate memories. So early studies have shown that if you give somebody a memory task and then you give them a chance to sleep or you just give them a chance to rest and reflect and sort of do something else, the amount of memory that you retain is better after sleep. And work from our group has also shown that if you stimulate specific types of sleep, you can actually improve your ability to remember from a task that you did the night before to the following morning. So one of the things that we think we that sleep also does is help us to really distill the important factors out of your day. Obviously, you don't need to remember every single thing about your day, what the carpet in this room looked like, you know, how many doors you walked past in order to get in here. But I hope that you take away a few salient points from this talk. And sleep helps you distill the gist or the important aspects out of your day. So that's what you remember one day from now, a week from now, a year from now. So with that in mind, kind of some of the reasons why we might sleep, what are we even talking about when we sleep? And one of the things that I want you to also take away from this is that sleep is not a passive process. Your brain doesn't just turn off 
for eight hours. It actually is very active and it's going through different stages of sleep. So in the lab, when we study sleep, we put electrodes on people's heads. So typically two in the front, two sort of at the top, and then two at the back. So we can look at the firing activity of the neurons in your brain. When you're awake, if you look up here, you can see if you're awake with your eyes closed, your brain has this very nice kind of rhythmic activity here, very regular. As soon as you start to fall asleep in something that we call stage one, you can start to see a little bit more irregular activity that shows up with your brain waves. Now, if you were to go into stage one, chances are you might not even realize you were asleep. So if I were to go in and wake you up at that point, you would probably say, oh, no, I wasn't asleep. I was just sort of resting my eyes for a minute. So it's a very, very light stage of sleep. Hopefully none of you make it into that during the next hour. Um, now, as we move into deeper stages of sleep, we move into something that we call stage two. And that's characterized by two distinct waveforms that we see on the EEG. There are these things called spindles that you have here, and these things called K-complexes that are here. Now, interestingly, we think that these serve to help protect your brain from outside stimuli to try to keep you asleep. And in fact, this K-complex was not named because it's kind of sharp and pointy like a K, but because it was stimulated by a knock. And so when early researchers were sitting watching people sleep, they would knock on the door and they would see the patient wouldn't necessarily wake up, but they would have this K complex. And so we think it's a way of the brain sort of trying to protect you from that outside noise in order to maintain sleep. Obviously, you still can be woken up, but it's trying to get you into that state. So then the next stage that we move into is the stage three that we have here. For some reason, a few years ago, we changed our scoring criteria. We decided to get rid of stage four so it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know why. Uh, but we've just grouped them all into non-REM three and four. Um, and you can see a distinct difference here. So you've got these big, slow waves of brain activity. And that's where it got its name. So we call this slow wave sleep. This is your deepest stage of sleep. This is where it's really hard to wake you up. If I wake you up from this, you're going to feel a little drowsy, confused. It's also a really stable form of sleep. So your heart rate stays the same. Your breathing rate stays the same. And so this is also an important sleep. And when I was talking about those studies we were doing where we were enhancing parts of sleep to improve memory, what we were doing was actually giving people little sound pulses to improve or enhance the amount of slow wave sleep that they get, and that seems to help with some types of memory. Now, the last stage of sleep that you go into is something called REM sleep, which is also rapid eye movement sleep, or some people call this dreaming sleep. It's a little bit of a misnomer. We don't only dream in REM sleep, but in the really early studies when they went in and woke people up at different types of sleep, they found that the most kind of fantastical, crazy dreams were always being reported out of stage REM sleep. But you can also have dreams in these other stages. They tend to be just a little bit more boring, kind of procedural, going to the store, doing what you'd normally do throughout the day. A couple of hallmarks about REM sleep, because if you're just looking at the brain waves, it might be hard to tell this apart from this. And one of the things that we also look at, we put little electrodes on your chin to measure muscle tone. And what we see is that when you go into this stage REM sleep, you also paralyze almost all of your muscles. The only two that still work are your diaphragm, so you can still breathe, because obviously that's very important, and your eye movements. And so hence the name of this. If you look at your eyes, you have these very sharp, rapid eye movements that occur during the stage of sleep. But everything else can't move which is actually really important, because if you're having some crazy dream where you are running down the street chasing some bad guy and beating him up, you don't want to also be doing that. And we'll talk about some sleep disorders where that paralysis gets lost. So what does a normal night of sleep look like? Again, it's a very active process. So you don't just spend all night in one stage of sleep or all night in another stage of sleep. You'll start off over here. 
and I lost there. You'll start off up here awake and gradually progress through the different stages, one, two, and three, four. And then you'll have a little short bout of REM. You'll progress through the stages again, a little bit longer bout of REM, again, longer and longer. So a typical night, you tend to have more of the stage three slow wave sleep at the beginning of the night and more of the REM sleep at the end of the night. Another thing you'll notice is that there are a couple little times where you wake up throughout the night. It also is not normal to just get into bed, close your eyes, wake up eight hours later in the exact same position, having no idea what happened for that time. We actually do, every time you go through one of these cycles, briefly wake up. You could think of it evolutionarily as, you know, you need to kind of sample your environment, make sure it's still safe to be asleep, and then you go back to sleep. Also, you don't want to stay in the same position for eight hours because you're going to get muscle cramps and you could compress nerves and that sort of thing. So it's normal to briefly wake up, turn over, go back to sleep. And that's something that I often have to counsel my patients on is that briefly waking up in the middle of the night is normal. That comes a problem when those awakenings become very prolonged. So probably the most common question that I get is how much sleep should I get? And I think most people will say the amount of sleep required is five minutes more. And that is because as a society, we are chronically sleep deprived. We're getting better about this, but we tend to place value on productivity and work and doing things, and sleep always tends to suffer because of that. Now, it's important to keep in mind that if you sacrifice sleep, you're also sacrificing health, and you're sacrificing productivity because you are not gonna function as well as, pro as effectively. So the National Sleep Foundation has released guidelines or recommendations for how long everyone should sleep throughout their lifespan. And these are ranges, I wanna point that out. So for most adults, you're falling within the seven to nine hour range. Everybody is a little bit different. So there really are genetics short sleepers. These are people who can get by on five or six hours of night forever and they never feel sleep deprived, but those are very, very rare. So most people it's seven to nine hours. And a good measure of this is to see how much you're sleeping over a period of time and if you actually feel tired during the day. If you could easily go take a nap at any moment, you're probably not getting enough sleep at night or you need to come see someone like me in clinic to figure out why that is. So that moves us on to a discussion of common sleep problems. So what are the things we see most frequently in the sleep clinic? And I'm gonna just walk you through this based on symptoms, so things that we frequently see. And the most frequent reason that people come into a sleep clinic or go to their primary care doctor is because they can't fall asleep. And so the most common cause of that is insomnia. So we define this as difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep. So it's either hard to fall asleep or once you get to sleep, it's hard to stay asleep. And we do emphasize that it's key that along with this, you have to have some sort of daytime impairment. So either you have a hard time performing well at work or social performance because of these sleep problems. And there are two different types of insomnia. So one of them is chronic insomnia disorder. So this is when you have at least three times a week, you have difficulty sleeping for at least three months. And then the other is short-term insomnia disorder. So that's basically the same problems that are there for less than three months. And the most frequent way that insomnia develops is this. So every one of you in this room has your own predisposing factor things that make it so you're not gonna have a good night's sleep. Some people, it could take everything in the world before they actually can't sleep at night. Other people, the slightest noise, the slightest change in environment, a minor stressful event the next day, and they're up all night. So we start out with your predisposing tendency towards insomnia. And then we add to that some precipitating factors. So this is, you have a major presentation at work the next day a family member dies, divorce, something big, something stressful that is naturally gonna keep you awake at night. And then you start doing things, we call these you know, other factors that keep you from being able to sleep at night. You start to worry about the fact that getting into bed 
it's hard. You're not going to fall asleep. What's going to happen if I don't sleep tonight? How am I going to perform the next morning? So then, over time, that acute factor, that big performance, that major life stressor may have resolved. But all of those other things that piled onto it, that subconscious worry about being able to sleep, is still there. And so that's what we need to target. And that's how you convert from the short-term insomnia into chronic insomnia. So how do we treat you if you've reached that point? And there are lots of factors that we can target. So first and foremost, we always talk about this idea of sleep hygiene. These are basic things, like making sure you've got a cool, quiet environment to sleep. Your bedroom is only used for sleep. You aren't watching TV. You aren't checking your laptop. You don't have your phone there. You aren't going on Facebook at 2 in the morning. Your bedroom is where you go to sleep. You also want to establish healthy sleep habits. So we have over here maintaining a healthy diet. And along with that, we also have growing evidence that it's really important to only to make sure that you don't eat within about two hours of bedtime to help out with your overall metabolism. Exercise is another key factor that plays into this. So we know that exercise regularly can improve your sleep quality, but it takes about six weeks of regular exercise before you see a substantial benefit. That being said, don't exercise too close to bedtime because then you're going to have that strong adrenaline kick that's going to keep you awake but incorporating daily exercise into your regular routine can be helpful. Down here, we have other methods for relaxation, yoga, mindful meditation, those can also be helpful. And then we do have medications over here in a corner. If I were making this chart, I would probably make this little wedge a lot smaller because we tend to focus a lot more on these environmental and behavioral things that you can do to help your sleep with medications as more of a short-term fix to help get you through that acute stage while we work on getting your brain back to a state where it can fall asleep. And that's the other component of this. So along with all of these basic sleep hygiene things, there also is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. So we have sleep psychologists who can actually work with you to change your mindset about sleep so that you don't have that subconscious fear of not being able to fall asleep so that when you go into the bedroom, bed is a place of relaxation for you again. And over the long term, that seems to be the most effective way of targeting insomnia to get people sleeping better again. So we may give people sleep medication in the short term, but really working on these other behaviors is key. Now, there are other factors that can also, and I do see a hand raised. I was asked to keep all questions for the end, so I will be sure to try to answer those at the end. Um, the other factor that can play into this are what we call circadian rhythms. And so these are your biological timing mechanisms that help place your body in a state that is more receptive for wake and more receptive for sleep. And we're going to go into this just a little bit more. So what I've depicted up here is what an ideal sleep diary would look like from somebody who slept really, really well. So each one of these lines is 24 hours. This is daytime. This is nighttime. And their sleep is falling sort of right in the middle of that nighttime window. And one of the first questions that arises if you look at this is whether this is simply a response to it being light out and so you're awake and it's dark out and you sleep? Or is there some sort of intrinsic timing mechanism that helps maintain this? And so in order to answer this question, several researchers actually have done experiments where they've taken people and put them into caves or ash off in Europe, put people in bunkers where they didn't have external time cues. So they don't have light. They don't have other interactions that can tell them what time of day it is. And they found that outside of those time cues, your daily patterns of rest and activity still persist. Now, in most humans, that daily rhythm is just a little bit longer than 24 hours. So if I left you in the cave every day, you'd be going to bed just a few minutes later every single night, waking up a little bit later. So we do depend on our environment to help keep us on track and keep us on this 24-hour schedule. So this is just a depiction of what 
this ideal individual would look like if we put them into the cave. So they're still awake for a consolidated period of time and sleeping for a consolidated period of time, but every day it just moves a little bit later. And what we know is that these rhythms are regulated by something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN. So what I've shown you here, and I think this is the only really strong biology slide I have in the talk, um, this is what we call a coronal section through a human brain. So basically, if I were to take and cut right through your brain like this, and we go about to between your ears, this little chunk down here is something we call the optic chiasm. So you have two nerves that come from your eyes. They go back, they cross, and then they go back to the back of your brain. So this is your optic chiasm. Just above or supra to that is the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And it's these two little dots outlined in yellow. And these are the parts of your brain that help you keep time. They do this by through a mechanism of multiple genes that are transcribed and translated in a very coordinated process that takes approximately 24 hours to occur. These are called clock genes. And some of you may have heard of these because within the last year, the three individuals who discovered these originally actually were awarded the Nobel Prize for Science and Medicine because they discovered that we have this mechanism in our body. We know that the SCN, or the suprachiasmatic nucleus, is your primary timekeeper, but you also have clocks in pretty much every other tissue throughout your body that help your body know when it's the best time to eat, when it's the best time to be active, when it's the best time to do pretty much everything in coordination with your environment. Now, obviously, if we have a biological mechanism in place, it, things can also go wrong with it. And so that's where we also find other reasons that people are unable to fall asleep. So this is something called actigraphy data from a patient of mine who has something called delayed sleep-wake phase disorder. Basically what we're looking at here, this is kind of like a medical version of a Fitbit. So it collects your daily activity. It also measures light exposure with this yellow line. So this is activity, this is light, and then blue are the windows where this individual is sleeping. Each line here is 48 hours, and this one's repeated down here, just so you can sort of see the overall pattern. And it's a little hard to see the times up here, but basically this individual typically is not falling asleep till four or five in the morning and waking up around one or two in the afternoon. And this is not because he's lazy. It's not because he's not trying to get into bed. By the time he came into clinic, he had lost multiple jobs because he simply wasn't able to wake up on time. Even if he'd go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, he wouldn't fall asleep until four in the morning. So his biological clock is just set later than the rest of the population. And so he didn't function well in an eight to five job, even though he could do the work incredibly well if he was there, he just couldn't do it at the time that they wanted him to perform it. And so this is a common thing that we look for, and about 10% of people that come into the sleep clinic complaining of not being able to fall asleep, it's not so much a primary insomnia, but we think it's a problem of timing. So there are things that we can do to adjust this timing to move people earlier in order to allow them to function in our nine to five society. Now, what about the other end of the spectrum? So we also have people who can fall asleep, but they can't actually stay asleep. So they may get a couple good hours of sleep and then they're up for the rest of the night. Some of this can be a primary insomnia like we talked about before. And if you remember, I mentioned we go through those cycles of sleep. And so one of the common things that happens is that people who develop insomnia will go through the first or second of those cycles, they'll wake up, and then they're, they're just put into an arousal mode and they just can't get back to sleep at that point. So that can be a primary insomnia, but it can also be a circadian problem. And so just like we have those extreme night owls that can't fall asleep and wake up until really late, we also have extreme early birds. And so this is just one example. It's a little messy because this is the actual sleep log from a patient. You can see she, this here is 24 hours and we're going from noon to noon. Here, 
She had a lot of family and social responsibilities, so she couldn't get into bed as early as she was tired. Ideally, she'd probably be going to bed somewhere around here at 7 or 8, but she has to get him to bed at 10 because she has to help her kids with homework, put people to put them to bed. And then she, like clockwork, wakes up at 3.30 in the morning, wide awake, ready to go, ready to start her day. The only problem is because she's sleep restricted from having to stay up later than she'd prefer, she does get tired throughout the day, but these first few hours here, she is performing at her best. She is at her peak. And so her problem is the opposite. She is, has what we call advanced sleep-wake phase disorder, where her natural tendency is to fall asleep and wake up much earlier than the average individual. So that can be another sleep disorder that we'll encounter. Now the next major category that we encounter are the people who are sleepy all the time. So we've ruled out the obvious things. They're going to bed, waking up at regular times. They're getting at least seven to nine hours of sleep at night, but they're still exhausted all day long. And so what's the most common disorder that we encounter with that? Obstructive sleep apnea. And I suspect most of you have heard about this in some respect. A lot of people have been diagnosed with this recently. People are much more aware of this in general. But one of the first descriptions of this wasn't actually in a medical text. It was in literature. And so Charles Dickens, in his posthumous papers of the Pickwick Club, has this description. And I'm quoting him directly. I don't mean to offend anyone. His name was Joe the Fat Boy. And this is his description of the first time Mr. Lawton met him. Mr. Lawton hurried to the door. The object that presented itself to the eyes of the astonished clerk was a boy, a wonderfully fat boy, standing upright on the mat with his eyes closed as if in sleep. He had never seen such a fat boy in or out of a traveling caravan, and this coupled with the utter calmness and repose of his appearance, so very different from what was reasonably to have been expected of the inflictor of such knocks, smote him with wonder. What's the matter, inquired the clerk. The extraordinary boy replied not a word, but he nodded once and seemed to the clerk's imagination to snore feebly. Where do you come from, inquired the clerk. The boy made no sign. He breathed heavily, but in all other respects was motionless. Now, the context of this, basically, Joe showed up to the door, and he was knocking, 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 knocking without stop. And when they finally woke him up again, what they found out was that Joe had been instructed to go over and just keep knocking until someone answers the door because they were worried he was so sleepy that if he stopped knocking just for one second, he would fall asleep again and his whole mission would sort of be foiled for that reason. And so in this original description, this is somebody who's incredibly sleepy because he does not sleep well at all at night. And he suffered from obstructive sleep apnea. So we can see here what has to happen normally when somebody is sleeping at night. You have to take air from your environment, get it through this whole obstacle course here, and it gets down to your lungs where there's a lot of cartilage that helps keep your airway open. But you can have your soft palate, your tongue, any other tissue that happens to be in the way here. So if you have extra fat in your neck area, that also is gonna obstruct, which is why that's where this was first described. But other factors can also serve to obstruct your airway. Every time this happens, your brain doesn't like not getting oxygen, so you're gonna wake up, open up that airway, and then the whole process starts over again every single time you fall asleep. This tends to be worse when you're on your back because gravity is not your friend. If you're laying on your back, it's much more likely that this tissue is going to obstruct, but it can also happen on your side in other positions. So how do we treat obstructive sleep apnea? We always talk about lifestyle measures. So weight loss can be important for some individuals. Weight can be a factor, but it's not the only factor. We talk about positional therapy, so moving to sleeping more on your side than on your back. There are oral appliances that dentists can fit you for. These basically move your lower jaw forward. By pulling your lower jaw forward, they also pull your tongue forward and open up your airway. Uh, there are surgeries that can accomplish the same thing. Um, there are surgeries that can cut away at some of your soft palate. And there's a new surgery that's out there. I can't say I recommend this for a lot of people, but it's something called Inspire that basically it's a pacemaker that sends a little wire to the nerve that goes to your tongue. You turn it on before you fall asleep, and then every time you breathe, 
it sticks your tongue out just a little bit to keep that airway open. It's a little odd, but it's sort of an option for people who can't tolerate other things. Um, gastric bypass surgery can be very effective if weight seems to be the primary factor contributing to this. And before we had other treatment options, tracheostomy actually used to be our gold standard. So this is actually putting a hole down here to bypass the obstruction. We almost never do this now. We try to avoid it at all costs. But it can be a solution. Probably the most common thing, and what many of you might be familiar with, is something called CPAP or BiPAP. Basically, the only difference between these, C stands for continuous, bi stands for bi-level. One just gives you a continuous pressure of air that blows in to keep your airway open. The other gives you two pressures, so a higher one when you breathe in, a lower one when you breathe out. They all accomplish the same thing, which is to push enough air in to help keep your airway open and prevent those obstructions. So what about other things that can make you excessively sleepy during the day? We've kind of moved through the more common one, which is sleep apnea. But narcolepsy is another thing that can make people very sleepy. And I encourage anyone who's interested in this topic to read this book called Wide Awake and Dreaming by Julie Flagger. She's a patient with narcolepsy who actually documented her experiences before and after being diagnosed with the disease, because for many of these patients, it really is a long road before they get to a point of having a diagnosis. And she depicts two key components of the disease in her book that I thought were really nice and I illustrated here. The first one is this idea of sleep paralysis. So she says, shortly after moving to Boston, I awoke one night to the sound of the front door being forced open. Afraid that someone was breaking in, I tried to sit up, but I was unable to move. I felt like I was strapped to my bed in a straitjacket. As I struggled, a figure entered my room and rushed directly at me. He wore a dark brown hoodie, hiding his face in shadows. His arms reached toward my head and neck, about to attack me. I struggled to move and get away, but it was no use. My body lay like a sitting duck, a perfect prey. Internally, I shuddered in terror. A few moments later, my body was released from the invisible restraint. I looked around the room, wondering where he'd gone. So you can see this was a very vivid and terrifying experience for her. She basically was in this state, in between wake and sleep, with elements of that REM sleep, where you can't move, where you have those vivid images, but elements of wake where she was aware of what was going on. So that's one component of this disorder. And this is the other key component, and this is her description of what it's like to experience cataplexy. A month later, I stood talking with a group of friends at a dinner party. Someone had said something funny, and as I laughed, my knees slid out from under me for a split second. I looked at my lower body, wondering what just happened. My friends continued joking. The weakness passed so quickly, I assumed they didn't notice. But the first incident from the month before came back like deja vu. Although I'd been laughing both times, I wasn't sure laughter was to blame until my knees buckled a third time, again while I was standing and laughing. And so this is a description of cataplexy, a disorder where while you're awake, strong emotions can actually trigger that paralysis of REM sleep. It doesn't have to be complete crumpling on the floor. Patients can describe things like their jaw just hanging open for a minute, their head dropping, their knees buckling. I had someone who was so excited about getting a baby kitten that every time she tried to pick it up, she was excited, but then she almost dropped it because her arms were buckling with the excitement and the joy of having that kitten. So again, it can be a very devastating symptom. We define this disorder as excessive daytime sleepiness occurring almost daily for three months. It's this REM sleep intruding into wakefulness that we're experiencing. And their features are cataplexy, which we just des described, the hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, where they're seeing these vivid dreams as they're falling asleep or as they're waking up, and the sleep paralysis, so that inability to move as you're falling asleep or as you're waking up. Now, before too many of you start worrying that you may have narcolepsy, you can have isolated sleep paralysis without the other symptoms. So if you only have the sleep paralysis, that can be a normal thing affecting up to 10% of the population. So the last of kind of the general sleep disorders I wanna go through are, I do strange things in my sleep. 
These are probably the least common things we see in the sleep clinic, but definitely the most interesting in terms of what insights they give us into the function of sleep and what goes on during sleep. So we break these down into things that come out of non-REM sleep. So those were those first three stages of sleep I talked about. And then things that come out of REM sleep. So that final stage of sleep that I talked about. Out of REM sleep, that's where we tend to get the sleepwalking. Confusional arousals are just kind of an early stage of that. Sleepwalking can be all kinds of complex behaviors. So people may walk, may drive, may eat, may do anything. And then sleep terrors tend to be more common among children. They wake with these blood-curdling screams, this very strong, what we call autonomic surge, where their heart's racing. And then very quickly, within just a few minutes, they may go back to sleep. Now, the other end of the spectrum, we have disorders of coming out of REM sleep. You can have nightmares arising from that stage. And then there's REM behavior disorder. So this is that disorder where you may be fast asleep, but you aren't paralyzed, so you start acting out your dreams. And then the last, the recurrent isolated sleep paralysis that I mentioned before. If you're interested in this topic, I'd encourage you to watch this movie by Mike Birbiglia called Sleepwalk With Me. It's a really good depiction of his struggles as he went through experiencing these various sleep disorders before he was actually diagnosed. He has what we call parasomnia overlap, where he actually has elements of both of these, the non-REM and the REM sleep disorders. And he's got some very interesting depictions. So now that we've talked about the most common sleep disorders, let's talk about specifically sleep and scleroderma. And I've kept this towards the end in part because there's not a lot of research in this area, I'm sorry to say, even though it impacts the vast majority of people who do suffer from scleroderma. There's very little data out there, but I've tried to pull together everything that I can find. So in general, if you look at patients with scleroderma, they complain of, they report poor sleep quality if you compare them to other patients who have other types of chronic illness that can impact your daily function, like rheumatoid arthritis, or healthy controls, not surprisingly. 76% of patients report difficulty sleeping sometimes, and 59% report sleep difficulties have a moderate to severe impact on their daily function. If we were to do a sleep study on any one of you, we'd likely find fragmented sleep, so Basically, we talked about it's normal to periodically wake up, but we'd see much more sleep fragmentation. And there'd also be decreased what we call sleep efficiency. So that's just a measure of, of the amount of time that you spend in bed, what percentage of that are you actually spending sleeping? The Canadian Scleroderma Research Group surveyed almost 400 patients with scleroderma, and they found that their symptoms that were most strongly associated with having sleep disturbance included if you had gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, that reflux can certainly be a big problem, and we'll talk about some of the research that's been done in that area. Pain is a big factor. So 60 to 85% of patients that experience pain have sleep dysfunction associated with that. And then itching, if present on most days, in 50% of patients also is a big component of sleep disruption. We also know that sleep apnea tends to be more prevalent. So in 55% of scleroderma patients with interstitial lung disease, sleep apnea was also present. And again, just a reminder of what it looks like with sleep apnea, you have your normal open airway here and your closed airway here. Another sleep disorder that we hadn't talked about previously is restless leg syndrome. So patients with scleroderma tend to have a higher number of what we call periodic leg movements during sleep, and also symptoms of restless leg syndrome. So this is a disorder where as you're trying to fall asleep, you might get an uncomfortable, kind of creepy, crawly feeling in your legs, like you just have to move them around, or you have to get up and walk around. And that can make it hard to fall asleep because you continue to have those uncomfortable feelings there. And it tends to be much more common in patients with scleroderma. 
pain is also a huge component of this. And so it tends to be bi-directional. So if you don't sleep well, it increases your risk of developing chronic pain. And if you have partial sleep deprivation, it actually decreases your pain thresholds. You may have the same amount of pain, but it feels much more intolerable because you didn't sleep well. Then the converse is, good sleep can increase the chance that that chronic pain will remit. So it's important to address other factors that might be impacting sleep in order to improve overall pain control. We also know that negative mood and depression can mediate this interaction. And so obviously targeting depression and making sure that that's well controlled can help with both the quality of sleep and pain control. Now, conversely, what impact does sleep disruption have on scleroderma? So how can not sleeping well at night impact your daytime symptoms? As we discussed, sleep disorders are common and can be associated with increased shortness of breath, reflex, and depression. And so if you don't sleep well, all of those things can get worse during the day. They also tend to correlate, sleep problems also tend to correlate with higher pain and itch. So we've, we understand that this is a problem. How can we address this? What specific things can we do to try to target this? And the general point of these next few slides is to just give you some ideas of things that you might discuss with your doctor if any of these topics seem to resonate with you. So if restless leg syndrome is something that tends to impact you, one of the first things that we do is check iron levels. So we know that this can be associated with low iron stores. You don't necessarily have to be anemic, but you may not build up a high enough store of iron within your body. And so we check something specific called ferritin, which tells us sort of what your iron savings account looks like. There are various medications that we can give that can help treat these symptoms. Avoiding nicotine at all costs can be very important for multiple reasons. And then physical therapy and stretching can also be helpful for treating this. Now, how do we address nocturnal reflux? Obviously, there's sort of the standard interventions. I'm speaking specifically about sleep-related interventions for this. And there was one study, very small, that looked at seven patients with scleroderma who didn't have sleep apnea, but they did have nocturnal reflux. And they found that even if you don't have that obstruction, CPAP may potentially help with that nocturnal reflux. Um, it reduced the amount of time spent with low esophageal pH, the number of reflux events that were longer than five minutes, and the length of the longest reflux event. Obviously, there are multiple other things you should try first, but if those aren't working, that's another thing to consider. Now, how do we address pain? I know there's another session going on simultaneously that's also discussing this, probably in much more detail. And pain is a really complicated topic to address. Again, just like insomnia, there are medications we can use to help with pain, but there are also a lot of behavioral things that we can use to target pain as well. There's a very specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy that can target both pain and insomnia. So working at ways to, tra to train your brain so that you are better able to sleep and you're better able to deal with the pain. There are also some medications, and so I just put one example here of gabapentin, which really can target neuropathic pain, can also help improve quality of sleep at the same time, and can also help with the symptoms of restless legs if that's an issue. Now, how do we address the itch component? So again, there are behavioral interventions, things like progressive muscle relaxation, something called habit reversal training, because sometimes the itch is less an actual itch that you need to scratch and more a habit that you've gotten into. And there are multiple medications that can also be used to target itch. And I've just listed several examples here. And then lastly, how do we address depression? So again, cognitive behavioral therapy is something that I keep coming back to because it also can be really helpful for targeting both the insomnia and the depression component. And there are a few medications that we often take advantage of, mirtazapine and doxepine as, as examples of antidepressants that can also be sedating. So they can kind of target both the depression component and the insomnia component. 